Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. I'm sorry, that should be 2 Timothy 4. I'm really good at mixing up some of the numbers in my notes. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And follow along as I read the first four verses of this chapter to you. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day with which to come and to praise you. We thank you for your word that instructs us in who you are and of what you require of the world and of us. We thank you that today we will go home to our dry homes with electricity and the relative comfort that we have with which to worship and to praise you, knowing that this morning there are churches who are uh, meeting probably in strange places or dirty places, or maybe who aren't even out meeting at all as they're trying to serve uh, their communities. Um, But Father, we have so much to be thankful for, so many earthly blessings that you have given us. But Lord, much more than that in Christ, you have given us every spiritual blessing and that he has secured for us an inheritance that no one can take away, that is guaranteed not only by his death and resurrection, but by your promised spirit who has been given to us, who has indwelled your people since that day of Pentecost so many years ago. Father, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit that not only sanctifies us and empowers us to live obedient lives to your word, but but illumines your word in our minds that we might understand and know you and your salvation and what you have done for us in Christ. And so, Father, I pray that today the result of this message would be your praise, that we would see you Uh, as the mighty God that you are and that we would submit ourselves in obedience to you and that we would glorify you for the gracious gospel that you have given us and by which you have saved us. Father, use your word today to teach us, to instruct us, to convict us and to move us to obedience. Father, give me boldness as I speak. Give me truth and accuracy as I uh, teach from your word. And uh, Lord, give us a a great sense of delight and joy in you. We ask that you would do this for your glory and for our good. Amen. We have been, excuse me, we have been in this series, How Then Should We Build? As we, we went through, as we've been going through 1 Corinthians uh, for some time now, we see this analogy that Paul employs of the church as a body. A body is made up of many parts. Each part has its own function. Each part is to do something different. And each part is dependent wholly upon the other parts of the body of Christ. And so borrowing that analogy and even borrowing some of the outline of this sermon from a book that I read, we have looked at the skeleton. We have seen what gives structure to the church. Without an intact skeleton, 
sin, a church cannot stand. And this might be an analogy that's a little close to home uh, for some here, but typically we talk in terms of people having fallen and broken a hip. But what we know is that that's pretty, a pretty inaccurate representation of what happens. What usually happens is that somebody breaks a hip and falls. The, the hip breaks, and once, once the pelvis is broken, the body cannot stand. And so we looked first at what is the skeleton of a church? What gives it the ability to stand? And we saw that first and foremost, we must have a high view of God. That we must not pull him down to be made into our image or make the mistake of thinking that he is like us. To reconstruct him in the image of our fallen nature. And as I've mentioned before, uh, someone once joked that God made us in his image and since the fall we have been returning the favor. We must have a high view of God. We must see his word as absolutely authoritative and we must see our purpose as a church to glorify God. It is the, the purpose we exist for as individuals and as the individuals who make up the church, it is the, by extension the purpose of the church. I would say, in fact, and we're going to see this today, that the church has two main purposes. There are two main uh, roles that the church is supposed to play. And that is the first is to glorify God. And the second is to sh spread the gospel throughout the whole world. But without those things, without a high view of God, without the absolute authority of Scripture, uh, we as a church cannot stand. And we have looked at some length now and have since finished on the internal systems, these spiritual attitudes, these, uh, the, the most important probably being obedience. If the word of God is absolutely authoritative, then we must be obedient to it. But we have seen uh, a, a host of spiritual attitudes that we are supposed to have. As a, as a skeleton without any, anything attached to it does not have life. So a church without these spiritual attitudes, these internal systems, neither does it have life. But once those internal systems are in place, you have to have muscles. Because without muscles, a church can't move. Now, babies are born with almost no muscle. They're born uh, unable to hold their head up. They're born unable to sit, unable to stand, unable to walk, unable to crawl. Uh, but what is in place there is a skeleton that gives them structure and internal systems that give them life. Once those are in place, then we begin to develop the muscles to build, uh, to exercise, to, to gain strength and thereby gain ability and to gain movement. And so today and over the next two weeks, uh, this is going to be a much briefer section. We're going to look at what are the muscles of the church. And honestly, this is the exciting part of this. We're going to begin to ask the question, what is the church to do? But I want to bring us back to our original caution. Number one, I am not going to make mention over the next, today and the next two weeks, of any programs. Programs are the skin of the church. These things that we're going to be looking at, these muscles that cause a church to move and have life and to be active, they're, they're not the, the way we organize a program. Those programs, and we're not going to talk about programs in this series at all, those programs are going to change as our community changes, as our culture changes, as our makeup as a body changes. Those things are going to change, and that's okay. We can, we can, those things can move, but these are things that should permeate every ministry, every program uh, to varying degrees. I'll admit that. Not every ministry is going to look identically the same, but these muscles are, are how we're going going to move. But uh, keep this in mind. Those internal systems are still our primary investment as a church. The spiritual attitudes of love and of a desire to grow and of humility and joy and patience and, and, and all of the rest that we talked about. And the list is long. I'm not going to go through them all. You can uh, find those sermons on the website. But without the, the investment in those attitudes, the muscles die. 
the muscles die. And so while we're turning now to the part of this series where, whereby we will see what we as a church are supposed to do, it doesn't give us an excuse to move on from investing in those spiritual attitudes that give us life as a church. And so today we're going to look at the first two of the muscles that cause us as a church to move. And the first, as you can see on your outline there, is preaching and teaching. This is, in fact, maybe the primary role and job of the church. Now, I'm going to lump these two things together, and we're splitting hairs here. Some people look at the way a pastor preaches and say, you're a preacher. Some people look at the way a pastor preaches and says, you're a teacher. Scripture makes no such biblical distinctions. In fact, if, if uh, well, I'm not going to go there, but, but the truth of the matter is uh, how I'm going to use these terms is I'm going to use preaching to refer to what happens from a pulpit and teaching to refer to what happens more in interpersonal relationships. Teaching maybe might involve more of a, of a dialogue, but the goal of these things is the same. Now, as we turn to 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 4, I want us to see that there's almost this courtroom uh, environment set up here. There's a charge. There are witnesses. There's a verdict. There's even accusations um, that, are, that are leveled here. And so I want, to have, I want us to see this as a kind of a courtroom setting. The first thing Paul tells Timothy... now. Timothy was a, um, a disciple of Paul. Paul refers to himself frequently in regards to Timothy as his spiritual father. He had led him to the Lord and he discipled him. He, he really replicated himself and his ministry and instructed Timothy and sent Timothy to pastor some of these churches that Paul was involved in the founding of. At this writing, Timothy is pastoring the church in Ephesus. And so these two letters, First and Second Timothy and the book following, Titus, we call the pastoral epistles. And that's because Timothy and Titus were pastors. And Paul is writing to these two pastors to teach them how the church is to function. And that's where we pick up in this letter, this second letter to Timothy. Paul says, I, that is Paul, charge you, that is Timothy. Now, let's stop there. This, this word charge means to solemnly urge in fact, the root of this word is the same root that we get our word martyr from. A martyr is a witness. We typically use the word martyr to refer to somebody who was killed for their witness. That's not exactly what the word originally meant. But this is, the root word here is witness. Uh, I'm, I'm witnessing, uh, I, am, I am solemnly urging you. I am really, in a sense, commanding you. We're going to see the command here in a minute. And then uh, we get kind of maybe both the judge and the jury. In fact, I think actually what we see here in this audience is more like a wedding. Weddings are, are, are to be performed in the presence of a community. And so a wedding often concludes with, because you have made these vows in the presence of these witnesses... What does that mean? That means that when we come to a, a, a wedding ceremony and people have made their vows, they have made a public vow. They have made a public covenant before people and before God and that they are committed to now for life. Well, Paul is saying, I charge you, not just in private, not just in the, this letter, but Timothy, I want to bring to your attention that this charge I'm giving you is not done in, in secret. It, you are being charged in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead. So here we see the judge in this courtroom, and Paul is almost warning Timothy, Timothy, this charge I'm giving you will not be a charge that goes unaccounted for. There is a judge, and you will have to answer to him, and he will judge both the living and the dead. And I'm charging you not only by his appearing, because he's coming back, but by his kingdom, because that is what we are seeking to build. And then we get here to the first command, preach the word. 
The, co- the word here command, or the word here preach, is in the imperative mood. This is not an option. Paul is not making a, a suggestion here. There is a mood for which he could have made a suggestion, for which he says this would be a possibility, or this would one be one option. But he doesn't speak here with, the, with that mood. He speaks in the imperative mood. It is a command Timothy, before God, before Christ, in light of his appearing and his kingdom, you must preach the word. Now, this word preach would have had a very different implications in Timothy's mind than in ours. The Greek word here is keruso, which is to herald. This would evoke, have evoked not an image for Timothy of a pastor standing behind a pulpit, but as a servant of the king proclaiming a royal edict. We've all seen this in movies where a scroll gets unrolled and the herald says, hear ye, hear ye, thus says the king and reads a message. And the herald is to present that message word for word, adding nothing to and subtracting nothing from the king's message. That would have been the image this would have evoked in Timothy's mind. Timothy, you are to herald. You are to take the message of the king and you are to proclaim it to the people. You are to preach it. The, the messenger, the herald, doesn't invent the message. He doesn't alter the message. He doesn't subtract from the message. He doesn't add to the message. He just proclaims the message. And so the, the first command we see here is that Timothy is to preach. But not only is Timothy given a command, he's given the content of what he is to preach. Notice Paul doesn't just say, in the presence of these witnesses, I charge you to preach. No, he not only gives him the command, he gives him the content. He says, Timothy, you are to preach the word. The herald, the messenger, is to preach one thing and one thing only, the word of of God. In the name of sermons, there are many today who get up and share anecdotes, experiences, stories, jokes, movie clips, and the like, but never delve into and explain the word of God. The church is to preach and teach the word. It is the word that changes hearts, Romans 10. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. It amazes me how the church today is abandoning the word of God in droves in an attempt to produce faith when we are told very clearly by God that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I've come into, uh, I've, I've encountered so many pastors recently who are so discouraged in their ministries. They're not seeing the fruitful uh, growth of faith and they can't figure out why. But they've completely abandoned the word of God. And then in an effort to try and make up for the lack of growth, they continue to press down a road further and further away from the word of God. And, and the, the problem just compounds itself and they don't understand why. Preach the word. There was a church in... In, uh, I meet with a pastor regularly. He's, uh, he's dying, and um, he has a friend who pastors a church of about 5,000 people uh, in the Seattle area. And this pastor up in the Seattle area looked at him and said, if I were to preach the whole Bible the way you do, my church would leave. I only do that on Sunday nights. And he asked him, he said, well, how many people do you have coming Sunday nights? And he said, oh, about 60 He said, well, there's your church. We are not to preach ourselves. We are not to preach movies. We are not to preach stories. We are not to preach anything but the word of God. And just in case we were wondering, Scripture is not only clear on what we are to preach, Scripture is clear on what we are not to preach. Keep a finger there in 1 Timothy, and you don't have to turn there if you don't want to. I'll read it to you, but I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 
I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. Paul talking about the ministry of reconciliation that has been given to the church, that we are ministers of the new covenant, that we are calling the world to be reconciled to God by grace through faith in Christ. He says this, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In other words, some people aren't going to get it. But when they don't, don't tamper with the word of God. Verse 4. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. We preach the word. We preach the written word that reveals the living word. We are commanded to preach. We are given the content of preaching. And thirdly, we see that there is to be continuity in preaching. There is to be continuity in preaching. Because the next statement Paul gives to Timothy is, Be ready in season and out of season. When pastor once said, some people ask, what season is it? My answer is, I don't know. And it doesn't matter because whatever the season is, you're either in it or you're out of it. There's only two options here. Preaching is either in season or preaching is either out of season. And whether it's in season or out of season, do it. Because God is going to judge the living and the dead. Preach the word. Sometimes this might be the season of a church that says, we don't want to hear the word of God. We've seen it quite frequently throughout history that faith, pastors faithful to the word of God were run out of their churches. Guys like Jonathan Edwards or a modern day example might be Steve Lawson. People get run out of their churches for preaching the word of God. Whether the church wants to hear it or doesn't want to hear it, the call on the pastor and on the church at large is to preach the word. But you know what? Sometimes it's not just the season of the church. Sometimes it's the season of the preacher. Sometimes the preacher might just say, I don't feel like preaching the word. There are times when maybe we're more excited about it than others and less excited about it than others. And Paul says, it doesn't matter how excited you are about it or others are about it. It doesn't matter what the season, you're either in it or out of it. So when is the time to preach the word? The time is always now. There is to be a continuity throughout the church of the preaching of the word. We should never fall into the trap of looking at the culture and saying, well, 500 years ago, people could listen to preaching, but that's not effective anymore. The word of God isn't effective because of our preaching. Our preaching is effective because of the word of God. Amen. We're never going to sit down around a table and say, let's have a public think and ask what's the most effective way to do ministry and come up with preaching. We don't preach because it's most effective. We preach because it's commanded and it is ordained by God. We preach so that people can hear the word of God and believe. And there is to be a continuity to, in the church of preaching. So there is a command to preach. We're given the content of preaching. We're told to continue in preaching. And lastly, Paul even gives us the characteristics of preaching. He tells us what preaching is to do. And again, these are not uh, commonplace. We have... Um, <laughs> I, I probably shouldn't tell that joke, but um, we have some pastors today who feel like their sole job is to just encourage people and make them feel good. I don't want to talk about anything controversial. I don't want to talk about anything that might cause people to think hard or question what they believe or be convicted about their actions. I, I, just, I just want to encourage people and that's it. 
But Paul uses three interesting words here to tell Timothy what preaching is and does, and encourage does not show up anywhere in the list. Now, that doesn't mean preaching shouldn't be encouraging. It should be encouraging. Not because it makes us feel good about ourselves, but because it makes us see Christ as glorious. The encouragement doesn't come because we're all right. The encouragement comes because we're not all right, and Christ is victorious, and because he's victorious, we can be made all right. That's where the encouragement comes. But he uses three words here. First, he uses reprove. This word reprove specifically means to expose or to convict. The first thing Paul calls Timothy to do is to expose their sin and convict them of it. Preaching that does not expose sin isn't preaching at all. How are people going to know they need to hear the gospel if they don't know that there's something wrong, if they don't know that there's sin to be fixed? We were talking this morning in the Men's Systematic Theology group. Paul is clear, both in Galatians and Romans, that the God-given purpose of the Old Testament law was to expose sin, to show us to be exceedingly more sinful than we ever could have imagined. God never gave the law with the intention of us being able to obey it. He gave the law with the intention of us breaking it so that we could see our desperate need for a Savior. Preaching must reprove. It must expose sin and convict the hearer. He then moves on to not a friendlier word, but a harsher word, rebuke. Rebuke. West Word Study lists this, the meaning of this word as this. A rebuke is a sharp, uh, a sharp correction with warning of impending doom. It is a sharp correction with warning of a pending, impending doom. The road of sin leads straight to one place, hell. And once that sin is exposed, the pastor is to remind, to rebuke, that living that way and pursuing that road always leads to hell. This does not mean that once we come to faith in Christ, we will be perfect. We're still desperately in need of grace. We will be desperately in need of grace for all eternity, even though eternity will look very different than it does now. But the call on the life of the believer is one of righteousness and holiness. Those who are characterized by a love for sin, they don't belong to God. That doesn't mean we can't struggle with sin. It doesn't mean that sin doesn't uh, capture us in, in wrong ways at times. But it means that uh, after sin is exposed, the word of God is to warn correctly of the dangers of sin in our lives. And make no mistake, whether you are unredeemed and on your way to hell or redeemed and on your way to heaven, sin is deadly. We saw this in 1 Corinthians 11, that when it came to the way the church in Corinth had approached the table of the Lord, God had disciplined some of them unto death for the way that they, they approached the Lord's table. That doesn't mean he sent them to hell, but it does mean that he said, I'm not going to let this happen any longer, and I'm going to bring you home. Sin is devastating in every life, even if it's been forgiven. We reprove, we, re, we rebuke, and finally we exhort. This word exhort is a pleading or a begging. It means to urge or to ask. I implore you, I beg you. Paul says this, I beg you by the mercies of God to walk in a manner worthy of the call that you have received in Christ. Preaching exposes sin, preaching warns of the impending doom of sin, and it pleads with people people to do something different. To the church, we plead for a, a change, a pursuing of righteousness, a, a spiritual discipline enabled by the Holy Spirit to walk away from sin. And to the world, it's a pleading not to step away from sin, but to be reconciled to God through gra by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. 
Preaching to the world and preaching to the church is no different. It exposes sin, it warns of sin, and it pleads people to do something. It's just there's a major difference in what that pleading is. If you are redeemed, it is a plea to live a righteous life. If you are not a, a believer, it is a plea to surrender to the lordship of Christ and be reconciled to God. The characteristics of preaching are to reprove, rebuke, and exhort. And just to close this section up, I want to show us a biblical example of what preaching is and preaching does. Because sometimes uh, preaching comes under fire. Well, I don't like the way you that, that was said. I don't like the way you do this or that. I've been criticized for using original languages in preaching. I've been criticized for going too deep. I've been criticized for many things. But I'm trying my best as I preach to follow a biblical example. So turn with me to Nehemiah. We're going to turn to the Old Testament. Testament, uh, Nehemiah chapter 8. Now what we have to understand is a little bit of the context of Nehemiah. Nehemiah and Ezra have returned to Jerusalem with the purpose of rebuilding uh, Jerusalem. They are tasked with rebuilding the wall and rebuilding the temple. Nehemiah is rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem, Ezra rebuilding the temple and Ezra is a scribe. Now, the reason they're rebuilding this is because uh, the, the nation of Israel has been in captivity for some time. Jerusalem has been destroyed. The temple leveled by the Assyrians. The, uh, the nation of Israel hauled off into captivity. And now they have learned a new language. The, the people don't remember their original language. And so there are some, like Ezra, scribes who remember the law. And so we're going to pick up with this return of the people during this time of rebuilding in Ezra chapter 8. And we're going to start in verse 1. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, that's their version of the Bible at the time, that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could understand what they heard, on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it, facing the square before the water gate, from early in the morning until midday. So in other words, the first thing that should be done is the Bible should be read for six hours. In the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose, and beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Messiah, on his right hand, and on and Padiah, Mishael, Milkijah, Hashem, Hashbadanah, Zechariah, and Meshulam on his left hand. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. As he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Maasiah, Kalida, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites, helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. So here's the specifics. We're going to get a recap right here in verse 8. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense. Now, your Bible, if it doesn't say clearly, should, or if it says, might say other than something other than clearly, but if it says clearly, note that there's a footnote there, number 6, and if you go down to, at least in my Bible, the footnote here says, or with interpretation, or paragraph by paragraph. So they read from the book of the law, uh, so they read from the book from the law of God, interpreting it paragraph by paragraph so that the people understood the reading. In other words, Ezra did three things. He read the text, he translated the text for the people who didn't know the original language of the text, and then he explained what the text meant. That's what preaching is and does. We look at the Greek, we look at the Hebrew, we read it, we explain what it says, we explain what it means, and then we beg people to live accordingly. That is what preaching is supposed to be. Why? Because we preach 
the word. Preaching is not just a spiritual pep talk. Sermons can and should encourage, but they should convict and condemn as well. We are to preach the word. Now, I want to say one final thing here, and then I'm going to move quickly through our next point. What should the attitude of the church be towards preaching? Turn back with me to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Paul tells Timothy something interesting in uh, verse 17 of 1 Timothy chapter 5. He says, let the elders, that would be the same word we would use for pastors, let elders or pastors who rule well be considered worthy of double honor. This word honor here, this idea of double honor isn't to think highly of them in a double fashion. The word honor is a monetary term. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double pay especially, here's the point I want to make today, those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it, re- when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. Now, I'm not bringing this up as a reference to how much I should or shouldn't get paid. That's not the point. The point is this, that the church should put a monetary premium on the preaching of the word of God. The church is to value preaching and teaching so highly that it wants to pay well those who do it to secure their time and devote themselves to the preaching and teaching of the word. Churches whose attitude is, you know, we're going to keep the pastor poor and God will keep him holy, they muzzle the ox as they work. They're burdening their pastors with the burdens of trying to pay a rent or a mortgage and care for their family and take a vacation that, are, uh, that in the end only reduce that pastor's ministry and effectiveness to the church. You know what else this makes a statement to? This makes a statement to the world. <laughs> Churches that think it's their job to keep their pastors poor proclaim to their communities that their pastors mean little to them. But a church who says, we're going to put a premium on the preaching and the teaching of God's word makes a statement not only to the rest of the church, but to the world, this is what we value. We are, as the early church was referred to, people of the book. Again, this is not at all a reference to what I should or shouldn't get paid, but to what you should and should not value. The church is to put a premium on the preaching of the word. Why? Good question. Two reasons. Because the preaching of the word informs everything we do as a church. But Logan, a church is, a, is to pray. You're right. Where are you told that a church is to pray? Logan, a church is to serve. You're right. Where are you told that a church is to serve? Logan, a church is to share the gospel. You're right. Where are you told that a church should share the gospel? Everything that we are to do, not only as a church, but as individual members of the body of Christ, is informed by Scripture. And if God is real and he exists, which I certainly believe that he is, we had better ask the question, what does he want from us? And here it is. So we look here. The second reason, we preach the word because it informs everything. And secondly, we preach the word so that the elect can hear the gospel and believe. We preach the gospel to the whole world so that the elect can hear the gospel and believe. Which leads us into our second point, and I will move quickly here. Um, Evangelism and missions. I want to cover both of these together because they both uh, pertain to the spread of the gospel. There's many ways in which these words get split and as to what they mean, but here's how I'm going to defi- define them for the purpose of this sermon today. Evangelism is personally sharing the gospel with people you come into contact with on a daily basis. Missions is the broad spread of the gospel. 
It is sending people overseas. It is creating organizations and ministries in an area with which to spread the gospel. But make no mistake, any community service that does not share the gospel is neither evangelism nor missions. It is community service. There is nothing wrong with community service. The church is called to it. But community service that does not specifically preach the gospel is not evangelism. And we can't hide behind community service as evangelism and pretend that we have done our duty. Evangelism is not optional. Speaking of the imperative mood, the last thing Jesus tells the disciples before he descend, or ascends to heaven in Matthew 28, 19, and 20 is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to go and to share the gospel, to make disciples, teaching them all that I have commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And as a confident reminder to us, he is with us. The, uh, the, the commandment to make disciples, to spread the gospel, is not optional. It's not just given to church leaders. It's given to the whole church. The church in Acts grew like wildfire. Do a search on just on the word bold in the book of Acts. It might be the single defining characteristic of the church in Acts. They were bold. Paul walked into a, a, a Greek religious center of worship with gods everywhere and said, you see this statue over here that's to an unknown God? I'm here today to tell you who he is. It might be akin to walking into you know, some other church that's not a Christian church today, uh, walking into a mosque or walking into who knows where and saying, hey, y'all are worshiping the wrong God and I'm here to tell you who the right God is. That's bold. The church is to be bold in its witness. Uh, someone once joked that Christians are like an Arctic river, frozen at the mouth. It's kind of a sad joke, but it's true. We're not willing to speak. We're not willing to open up. We're not willing to preach the gospel uh, to the world or, or most of the time not even to ourselves. Preaching doesn't always involve standing at a pulpit. It can involve a, a dining room table. It can involve a cup of coffee. It can involve hammer and nails. It can involve windshield time. Preaching the gospel is simply telling people the truth of what God has done. If preaching and teaching is the church's diet, evangelism and missions is its exercise. <laughs> You can have a church that feeds heartily on the word of God, but if there's no exercise, you're going to clog the arteries of the heart and die. It's not sufficient to sit at a table and feast on end without any exercise. We are to clearly feed on the word of God to desire it as a newborn infant longs for milk. But then we are to go out and to exercise as the church by spreading the gospel and telling people the truth. Food without exercise is a spiritual heart attack. Preaching without evangelism is a church heart attack. If you want this place to be full, if you want full pews, if you want overflow seating, if you want two services, don't ask when is Logan going to be more entertaining ask when am I going to share the gospel with people who don't know it my job is to reprove rebuke and exhort and to share the gospel with people every bit as much as you are but the church is caught up in a term I've used before professional pulpitism we put some money in a plate and hope that he does all the work for us it's not God's design for the church my job is to feed you your job is to go work out there are two necessary components to evangelism. One is obedient living and second is bold speaking. The number one charge against the church is that it's full of hypocrites. Yeah, I went to that church and there was a pastor there and he preached, but that place is full of hypocrites. I have no interest in going there. Your life gives credence to your words. Philippians chapter 2 Verses 14 and 15 says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Our, our living gives credence to our preaching. We don't go out and put on airs and say, Well, I'm perfect and you should be like me. Remember, we don't preach ourselves, we preach Christ. 
and him crucified. But when, our, when we go out with filthy, dirty lives like the world and say, you need Jesus, they say, why? You and I are just alike already. Why should I give up my Sunday mornings and put money in the offering? I could sleep in. I could take out the boat. I could go do something with my family. I could stay up late and get drunk on a Saturday night. Why do I need Jesus? We're already alike. The way we live gives credence to our words. And we must ask the question, however, what is the gospel? If we're to share the gospel, what is the gospel? And I would say there are five basic points to the gospel. There is more to the gospel, but there can be no less to the gospel than these five things. The first is that everyone is a sinner. Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone has sinned. Everyone has done wrong. Recently saw a video of an evangelist who uh, was talking to somebody and they said, I've never done anything wrong. He said, have you ever lied? She said, well, yeah, I've lied. She said, have you ever stolen anything? She said, well, yeah, once I stole something. She said, have you ever looked lustfully on somebody? Well, yeah, of course I've done that. He said, well, Jesus says to look on somebody with lust is to, be, is to commit adultery. So what you've told me is that you're a liar, a thief, and an adulterer. It's that simple. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Number two, all sin deserves eternal punishment. Romans 6.23a, the wages of sin is death. The just do deserved payment for everyone who is a sinner is death. But the story doesn't um, end there. The third point is that the gospel, or that God, rather, has accomplished the means of salvation, and there is nothing you can do to earn it. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He, that is God, made him, that is Christ, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We play no part in securing our salvation. God sent Christ. Christ accomplished it. We can reap the benefits of it. The fourth thing is the second half of Romans 6.23. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Everyone is a sinner. Everyone deserves to die. There is nothing you can do to earn entrance into heaven or to be reconciled with God. But God will require nothing of you. He freely gives it. But that begs a humongous, humongous question. If it's a free gift, how do I appropriate it? How do I get it? And there is one answer and one answer. By faith alone. By faith alone. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, uh, if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What is faith? What does it mean to have faith in Christ for salvation? It is the willful and total surrender of yourself to the Lordship of Christ. How do we preach the gospel? We say you're a sinner desperately in need of salvation and without it, you'll go to hell. But praise be to God who has provided the way, who has punished somebody in our place and because of him has offered us this righteous life that we can freely have and he will freely give if we will simply surrender ourselves to the lordship of Christ. And if they're not interested, we can't change the bargain what happened with the rich young ruler he came up to jesus and said what must i do to be saved and when jesus gave him the answer he didn't like it you know what it says after he turned around and walked away from jesus it says he went away sad if jesus is not willing to lower the terms of absolute and unconditional surrender of of the believer to his lordship then neither should we it is a non-negotiable gospel. It doesn't require a prayer. It doesn't require a walking forward. It doesn't require baptism or anything else in the world. 
It is simply and only a willful surrender to the Lordship of Christ. And I might add to that, uh, this, this is not a... This is not the end of a war where I fly a white flag and hang my head in defeat. This is a willful surrender of trading up from the worthless things of the world to be satisfied with the joyful riches of Christ. Don't think of surrender as this un-American, I'll die before I surrender thing. When it comes to the gospel, equate surrender with ultimate joy ultimate satisfaction in the one in whom our hearts were designed to be joyful in. What do we do with all this? We insist on the regular preaching of the word. We insist on the regular preaching of the word. And quite honestly, and quite contrary to our culture, not only do we insist on the regular preaching of the word, we insist that the more preaching we have, the better there used to be a time where churches met on Sunday mornings and for Sunday school and for Sunday on Sunday nights and on Wednesday nights and people throw their hands up in the air and say, well, Logan, that's just not the world we live in anymore. We're too busy. That is not accidental. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. If you read Matthew 24 and 25 and Revelation and First and Second Thessalonians and say, Lord, we see the signs of the times, we see your coming, the church should be standing up and say, this is not a time for us to meet less but more because we're going to need it because the days are evil we insist on the regular and frequent preaching of the word but secondly we we live obediently to the preached word the gospel lived give, the gospel lived gives credence to the gospel preached we don't just gather and preach the word. We gather, we preach the word, and then we submit ourselves to it. And lastly, we be bold in the sharing of the gospel so that the elect can hear and believe. Father, let us be of those who have willfully surrendered our lives to you. Let us be of those who, uh, who have traded everything this world offered and sold all our goods, unlike the rich young ruler, been willing to give up this earthly treasure to buy that field in which there is a pearl of great price. Father, let us see that we don't come to the gospel with a dejected, sad surrender, but with a joyful surrender to a gracious and sovereign king. Father, make us hungry for your word. Make us hungry for your word because we are hungry to know you and to be satisfied with you. And Father, as we take in your word, let it ignite a boldness in us to share the gospel, to take part in this ministry of reconciliation. Father, we pray, I pray as I have been, that it would start, and I mean start, with one person. One person who, who because of a faithful willingness of somebody in this body to share the gospel, surrenders joyfully to you. And that that would light a fire in us for the spread of the gospel. Keep us from being fat and heart-sick consumers. But to walk in a manner worthy of the upward call that we have received in Christ Jesus. To exercise our spiritual gift. To, to share the gospel. Not because we think it is the most effective way to minister, but because it is the most faithful way to minister. And Father, now as we come to your table, 
I ask, Father, that you would let this be part of our proclamation of your death until you return. And that we would see that this proclamation should not only take place inside these walls at this table, but outside of these walls in evangelism and missions. Father, at your table today, remind us that you are the author and the perfecter of our faith. You are the designer and accomplisher of our faith. You are the king of kings and lord of lords who sacrificed himself willingly on our behalf that we might be redeemed. And then let us see ourselves in response to this as faithful heralds of what you have done. Spark an excitement in us that cannot be contained, that we must tell the old, old story. We ask that you would be glorified in it. Amen.